Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Firehawk DES symposium. It's possible thanks to an unrestricted grant from Microport. And the title is Proven Fast Healing from Target Clinical Program. It's uh, a delight to be part of this team here. The session will be co-chaired by Dr. Marty Leon. Thank you, Marty, for joining. It's a pleasure. And we have Xubo from Fubai Hospital and Andreas Bomberg, London, UK. <laughs> so Marty is going to uh, kick it off and um, share with us the session objectives and also uh, summarize for us the global picture of the Firehawk DES clinical program. Thank you, Marty. William, thank you very much. I, I want to point out that there are microphones in the room, so for the questions, please feel free to interact. We think interaction and discussion is very important, but we would request that you use the microphones because this session is being recorded. So I've been asked to discuss both the objectives and a little bit more about the global clinical program associated with the Firehawk drug eluding stent. I have no conflict um, related to this session. The objectives are very clear, to understand what this novel technology is, which is an abluminal groove-filled biodegradable polymer drug eluding stent, to learn about the most up-to-date clinical data on the Firehawk DES program and some future studies that are both ongoing and planned, and to, of course, discuss the potential benefits of this novel drug eluding stent platform to our patients. So very briefly, the technology is probably well known to many of you in this room. <clears throat> it is a cobalt alloy stent, which is highly deliverable, thin struts with embedded abluminal grooves. The drug is sirolimus at appropriate doses. There is a bioresorbable polymer that fills with the drug the spaces in these abluminal grooves, um, and it's a PLA-absorbed polymer, which within the first six to nine months is now fully resorbed so that you're left with a metallic surface. This slide really summarizes the entire target Firehawk DES global program. It began with important first in man studies, which was a non-randomized trial in 21 patients, which is completed with five-year follow-up. There was a one-to-one -one randomized trial versus science with QCA follow-up, including a total of 460 patients, both completed in China. At the same time, there was a side-by-side -side long vessel study with 38 and 33 millimeter devices that was non-randomized versus a performance goal in 50 patients, and another non-randomized study also with a performance goal of 730 patients. Now, all of these studies have five-year follow-up already. Importantly, target AC is a one-to-one -one real-world randomized trial versus an Everolimus eluding control stent in over 1,600 patients. This will be discussed later, and this is a study, as you can see, represented by the European Union. It is now an ongoing clinical trial. There are many other studies that are both in the planning phase and also ongoing, and I'll just briefly mention a few. We are fortunate, hopefully, this year to see the Firehawk DES in the United States as part of a randomized US IDE study versus an Everolimus eluding stent control in approximately 1,000 patients. This hasn't begun yet, but we expect it will begin at some point in the second half of this year. There's a CTO study, which is ongoing now, which is an interesting randomized trial. There also are high bleeding risk studies which are randomized, which are proposed, and also a short-term DAP study which is ongoing, both done in China. There's also a registry, a real world registry in China of 2,000 patients, and a Malaysia um, uh, study also <coughs> which is ongoing in over 1,000 patients, and interestingly, even a left main study is now uh, being conceptualized and proposed, which is a randomized trial. So this is a very robust clinical trial program involving many thousand patients, multiple clinical trials that are randomized with good control arms. So the scientific rigor of the global program really cannot be challenged. This is a very brief overall summary of some of the current data. We've mentioned the patients in the first in man study, the target one randomized trial, the long lesion and target two um, registries. And I'll break it up into OCT follow-up. You'll see some very interesting four-month uh, OCT data 
showing that the uncovered strut rate is only 3.8% with the Firehawk. There's been a lot of angiographic follow-up data showing very low late loss, 0.13 at 13 months, 0.16. Um, again, showing that there's been no increase in late loss between early and late angiographic study, and this has been now replicated in multiple studies and in different lesion subsets, including long lesions. And a variety of clinical follow-up outcomes, including low rates of cardiac death, exceedingly low rates of stent thrombosis, both early, late, and very late, and very low TLR events in the various subsets of patients that have been thus far studied from the early target programs. You're going to hear a lot about the target all comers study, which is an open label, non inferiority trial comparing, comparing Firehawk versus the Zions EES with very careful follow up at 20 sites in Europe with QCA in almost 200 patients and a sub study of OCT in 50 patients. And we'll hear more about that in the next few moments. The primary endpoint and secondary endpoints are well-defined classic endpoints that will give us a better understanding of how this device performs against what is one of the standard current generation drug eluting stents. So the agenda of this program, um, uh, Andreas Baumbach will share some of his cases from the target all comer trial to give us an, uh, his version of how this device has been performing. Um, William Wines will talk about the three-month OCT follow-up from the target all-comer trial, and Jubo will uh, um, uh, update us on the China experience with the five-year follow-up, both from the target one randomized trial and the um, five-year target two follow-up results. So thank you very much, and we look forward to a very energetic symposium. Thank you very much, Martin. So as I mentioned, Andreas Baumbach is going to be discussing some shared cases from the target all comer trial. And of course, Andreas is, um, uh, is from the United Kingdom. Which was still in Europe when we did the trial. <laughs> <laughs> and geographically, at least, we'll remain there. Um, yes, uh, it's a great pleasure to share some cases uh, with you. And uh, these are my uh, conflicts. And I will do that. Uh, with a view to achieving two things. One, to show you a bit, uh, get an idea about what an all-comers trial means, what the target AC trial uh, actually means, what kind of patients we enrolled. Uh, and then secondly, to show you the performance of the stand with a couple of selected cases, all my own cases that I've done in Bristol as part of the uh, study and our enrollment in, in this uh, trial. I'll make, I'll highlight some specifics of the performance. That's the next 10 minutes. Case number one, a right coronary artery, a 65-year-old lady with a non-STEMI uh, inferior T-wave inversion and a lesion in the right coronary artery. That's the left, uh, pretty much standard normal. Now, this is not a complex lesion, a proximal RCA lesion randomized to the firehawk. Uh, predilated and then stented with uh, 12 atmospheres, high pressure post dilation as is usual in our center. And the reason I'm showing this case, which is a fairly standard uh, uh, case for an angioplasty, is to show you the visibility of this stent. It is more visible than, than uh, uh, most. Um, it's very easy to place it. It's very easy to assess it uh, after placement. This is the final result. Case two, a bit more complex, a left anterior descending artery in a 79-year-old gentleman uh, with a non-STEMI, there was no age limit. Uh, previous bypass surgery with grafts to right, OM and uh, LAD, another bypass surgery with a left radial to the LAD and a diagonal. Now, on the angiogram, the radial graft was patent, but there was a calcified stenosis of uh, actually the diagonal branch, as you can see here, the right was blocked, there are several stumps where there used to be access to the coronaries, this is the radial graft, and then you can see the target in the middle of the, uh, um, of the picture, heavily calcified, uh, was, turns out to be in diagonal in the end, randomized to the firehawk. So we used rotablation uh, to prepare the lesion here, we predilated 
uh, with a 2.5 mm balloon, extensive predilation, and then a 2.5-23 mm Firehawk, followed by a 3 by 33 mm Firehawk, uh, with this result post-implantation and high pressure post-dilation with a 3.0 NC balloon with this final result. So more complexity and enrolled into the trial. Good performance here. A left main, 79-year-old gentleman, stable, angina, severe LV impairment. The diagnostic angiogram showed a patent right coronary artery and an osteal lesion in a just about 8 to 10 millimeter left main stem. This was our target. Uh, the case was discussed with the surgeons, not found uh, suitable for bypass surgery. Uh, we randomized uh, the patient into the trial and he received a firehawk. Uh, we predilated uh, with a nominal size uh, balloon and then uh, put a 4 by 13 firehawk stent in, just flush on, post dilated with 20 atmospheres with this result. And I really should highlight one thing there is palpably less recoil uh, with this uh, stent here. In this case, this was not a problematic case, uh, but looking at the final angiographic uh, result, uh, it was excellent and it was as post-dilated without recoil. The patient was discharged home the next day. Case four, a 52-year-old gentleman, young, but history of uh, kidney disease and hypertension, acute chest pain, anterior ST elevation came on the table via the uh, STEMI pathway, a patent right coronary system, and the left, uh, you can see on the right. <laughs> it was an LAD bifurcation uh, stenosis, a 1-1-1 one, one, one with uh, a big LAD, a big diagonal branch, and we proceeded uh, within the trial to do a DK crush, so a 3 by 15 millimeter des crushed, went back in with this interim's result. The first kiss there, and again side branch access because of the cell size of this particular uh, stent is, is very easy and it's not a problem uh, to bring uh, larger sized uh, balloons back in or uh, do even culotte uh, stenting, which we have done as well. Um, this is a 3 by 38 uh, stent, and then a second kiss, and then post dilatation with a non-compliant balloon, as you've seen before, with this final result, and again, this patient did very well. So finally, uh, actually, a bit ahead of time, um, I just want to give you a flavor of what we uh, see when we do OCT in these patients. You will see uh, the first presentation of the three-month results in a moment, but here are some pictures of one uh, case uh, that we enrolled into the OCT a substudy. This is a patient uh, with an obtuse marginal uh, lesion and stable angina pectoris who received a 2.5 by 33 millimeter firehawk, and I'll show that again. That's the post-procedural result down here. This is pre. After implantation, post-dilatation, and then at three months, uh, this patient uh, came back with this angiographic result and uh, this OCT pullback that uh, showed an excellent result, complete strut coverage uh, as in the majority of patients, no malaposition, um, simply a great result, also angiographically and on the OCT. With that, um, I actually summarize. I've, I've shown you uh, uh, examples of our uh, experience with the uh, Firehawk stent in the target all comers trial. And the point number one I want to make, this was a true all comers trial. That doesn't mean every single patient that comes through the cath lab is enrolled because there are some uh, criteria. If the research nurse is not there, if it's in another trial, if the patient doesn't want to uh, be consented. But there was 
practically no exclusion criteria from a lesion point of view. And patients presenting with stable angina, non-STEMI and STEMI were enrolled. So also the presenting uh, condition was uh, not selected. Simple to highly complex lesions, as we have seen, were randomized to Firehawk versus Xions. And in our hand, we felt that uh, this is a good workhawk horse uh, stand excellent performance throughout, including complex procedures, including doing culotte stenting left main uh, and complex uh, bifurcations or CTOs. With that, I close. And thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions for Professor Baumbach? Andreas, you've shown a, a beautiful variety of complex cases. And if I were to, to deconstruct, I would try to articulate some of the technical advantages. And you tell me if you agree. Certainly the radio opacity looks to be very favorable of this device. So it's one of the things that we look for now in new stents. Yeah. And you show that in that proximal right coronary very, very nicely. So it is radio opaque, um, uh, not to the extent that it irritates you. It's, it's just a very good visibility of the stent, which enables not only placement, but also post dilatation. You can, can precisely uh, place the post dilation balloon to the edge of the uh, stent. It is visible without stent enhancement technology. It's also very deliverable. You show that in that long lesion in the diagonal branch from the radial graft that was heavily calcified. So deliverability is certainly important. And you also showed in that complex LED diagonal bifurcation that you could work through it and do DK crush and seemed like it could be done relatively effortlessly given the wide strut. Um, uh, um, space for bifurcations. Yes, uh, indeed, in, in the experience of, of, of around 100 patients um, in our center with various operators, we didn't have a single case where we had to cross over uh, to another technology. We delivered the stent when we wanted it, and that includes heavily calcified lesions with and without rotablation. That includes osteal uh, lesions. The second point about the cell size uh, is really well made. Uh, we did uh, uh, many bifurcations and, and uh, occasional uh, culotte stenting, uh, and it is an easy access into the side branch, and there is no problem inflating uh, the larger size stent through the, uh, through the side. And you finally showed in that left main lesion that you could put it in, in large osteal vessels with the likelihood that you would have very little recoil and good expansion of the device, which for some of the newer um, thin strut uh, drug eluting stents can be more problematic. Yes, I mean, this is a thin, this is 86 micron uh, technology, and still, as we actually will, will see or can, uh, can deduct from the OCT data that we will see or the QCA that comes with it, uh, there is indeed less recoil also measured in the QCA data that we have so far. So one question, Andreas. Um, with the, the abluminal groove technology and the absorbable polymer, let's take it outside of the clinical trial, in clinical practice. What would be your general use of dual antiplatelet therapy with a device like this? Is it changed, and does it provoke you to use it more frequently in certain patients? Um, I think we would have to have data. It's, it's, it's very likely that, that we can uh, extrapolate once we have seen the OCT data uh, that we can extrapolate uh, with uh, experience with other stents to reduce dual antiplatelet treatment uh, safely, but of course we'll have to have those clinical data. Um, I don't think I would be uh, ready at the moment to reduce it to four weeks, uh, similar to a bare metal stent, knowing that it takes 90 days uh, to deliver 90% of the drug, so uh, I'll stick with three months. But generally, I think this is a workhorse uh, a stent uh, that can be used in all situations, stable, unstable, and STEMI. And I would actually adopt my dual antiplatelet treatment according to the presenting uh, syndrome. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes, could you use the microphone, please? Yes. A technical question on on the stent strut. I believe they've constructed a groove into the stent strut to then deliver the polymer through that. Do you think there's 
going to be an advantage to that in the long term in terms of reducing stent thrombosis? I think the advantage of that technology uh, comes uh, with the fact that you have less drugs uh, and, and less polymer, so maybe less reaction. We would hope that translates into less stent thrombosis, but that gets us into an area where we're talking less than 1% and you know 0.5%. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to prove that. But I, I think as a concept, it's a favorable technology. Anyone else? Andreas, you mentioned about the OCT data. We'll see in a minute. Then there is the QCA SEP study, and then there is the primary outcome results. Mm -hmm. What are the timelines? When can we expect those results? I think QCA, uh, together with the uh, clinical endpoint, the one-year uh, outcome, this time next year, and this place. I have two questions. The, the first question is, uh, did you use the IWAS guy in every case? No, we used, uh, this was a very clinical scenario. We did not use IVAS uh, guidance outside of left main stenting where we use it generally, but that differs from center to center. Mm -hmm. And what kind of uh, different do you, do you use? I mean, the copidogel, ticacular, or pasucal? Again, there was no restriction uh, from standard use. There was a, a recommendation to use dual antiplatelet treatment for at least six months according to standard practice. In the center I worked uh, at the time, we used uh, aspirin and clopidogrel for stable uh, patients and aspirin and ticagrelor for unstable uh, non-STEMI and uh, STEMI patients for 12 months. Andreas, thank you very much. That was really a wonderful presentation. And now I'm going... And now I'm going to invite our co-chairman, William Wines, who's going to give us a new release presentation on the three-month OCT follow-up results from the randomized target all-comer trial. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. These are my conflicts. So as we've just heard, target all-comers is a prospective randomized post-marketing trial designed to assess the safety and efficacy of the Firehawk rapamycin target eluting cobalt chromium coronary stent. And um, we've seen the design of the trial. So what we will be releasing now at this meeting is the three months OCT subset data in a group of patients uh, from uh, randomized to either device. And uh, 50 patients were actually uh, included in that study. This was a pre-specified study. And of course, the objective is to evaluate the healing process as well as the intermost threat coverage in patients randomized to either device. So what would we study exactly? 50 consecutive patients, 50, 25 per group. They were enrolled at six pre-selected centers, proficient in OCT. And um, would like to thank uh, some, some of the investigators in this room for allowing me to show these data. It was performed at three months or prior to revascularization in case uh, it would occur prior to three months. This is a complex slide, but the primary endpoint is what is important. Primary endpoint is a comparison of neo intermal thickness, and the hypothesis was a non inferiority test compared um, Firehawk versus Xyons V. And you have here the uh, assumes mean neontimal thickness and the non-inferiority margin. But of course, in addition to that, we have all sorts of measurements uh, that can, are attainable with OCT uh, from the core lab. This is how it was actually measured um, because it does matter um, where you actually measure things when you compare these devices. So on the left, the Firehawk, on the right, the Science, and um, in this particular case, if you look at the neo intimal thickness, so if you look at the lower left for Firehawk and the right, lower right for Science, the measurements are endoluminal. That means that the thickness here, oh, maybe I can show it like this, the thickness is going to be measured from the abluminal contour of the strut. Okay. The alternative would be to measure it from the abluminal, which is actually desirable 
if you're comparing two devices that have different strut thickness. In this particular case, we're looking at 86 versus 82 strut thickness micrometers. So, in fact, it is perfectly appropriate to measure in this endoluminal fashion. So these are the uh, data that you will see in a second primary endpoint, and it's important to actually look at this whenever you're comparing an OCT analysis uh, for healing. So this is the device comparing Firehawk to Xyance. As the colleague alluded to, the drug is located and released from this little groove there that you can see over here. And of course, uh, in one way, uh, an advantage could be that the drug density is actually lower. Polymers, of course, are also different. In the case of the Firehawk, we have a, a bioresorbable polymer, while it is a permanent durable polymer with science. Patient demographics are listed here, nothing really particular. These are the slides showing uh, the essential results. This is about the procedure itself, how it was performed. There's a um, couple aspects perhaps to mention. Very high uh, post-dilatation rate. Well, surprisingly, fewer post-dilatations with Firehawk than with Science. Procedural duration the same. Um, balloon diameters tended to be a bit higher with the Firehawk on average, as well as the size of the post dilatation balloon, but it was not significantly different. These are the, OC, the QCA results in this particular subset of patients in whom the OCT was performed. So it's important to verify the baseline parameters and also the post-procedural dimensions of the vessel. And as you see, there are some small differences here. For instance, um, the reference vessel diameter tended to be a bit larger, not significantly different, with Firehawk than Science, which actually corresponds also with the somewhat larger balloons that were used. But uh, perhaps even more importantly, the instant diameter stenosis post-procedure just reach statistical significance here, it was actually lower residual stenosis inside the stent with Firehawk than it was with Science. And the same is true, actually highly significant for the in-segment diameter stenosis residual. So in both cases, good results, but somewhat larger dimensions in the Firehawk than with Science. And actually one parameter to look at is the gain, acute gain, and that is also significantly larger with the Firehawk. This is now the essential result, namely the uh, primary endpoint by OCT, the amount of neo-intimal thickness, and um, the hypothesis was actually achieved, and the um, uh, neo-intimal dimension was 75 on average versus 82 for science, so the non-inferiority hypothesis was verified. We have a number of secondary OCT substudy endpoints that were all non-different between the two devices, although each time the dimensions tended to be a bit larger, numerically larger with Firehawk than with Science, whether it's diameter, area, or volume. Very low instant neo-intimal volume obstruction, 8% versus 9%, with comparable stent length in the two groups basically no malaposition. And this is the slide summarizing the strut analysis, individual struts, mean number of struts analyzed for each device. And whether you look at malaposition, uncovering, combinations, any of that, the rate of well-opposed and covered, no difference and actually very high, very good healing. For instance, the uh, proportion of uh, well-opposed and covered struts was the same in both groups. Uh, close to 99%. So why are these data important? First of all, we met the primary non-inferiority endpoint, and all CT parameters compare well with the science results. So the essentials to remember from this uh, OCT sub-study, why did we do the study? We wanted to evaluate the early healing and intimal strut coverage between the two devices. What did we do? We used OCT, performed at SIT-selected sites, participating in the randomized study 
was all analyzed by CoreLab. How did we do it? CoreLab analysis at three months. And the results you've seen, neointimal thickness at three months was non-inferior to science when using Firehawk. And why is this important? All OCD parameters compare actually favorably with parameters obtained with the science device. Thank you. Are there any questions for Professor Wines? That was beautifully presented, William, a very elegant study. Um, and it shows that there's very little neointimal hyperplasia with this device and certainly excellent strut coverage. Um, but we're contrasting two different genres. We're contrasting a, dura a so-called durable polymer, fluoro polymer, to deliver a drug versus an abluminal grooved absorbable polymer Yet the results look pretty much equivalent. So, so what do we conclude from that in terms of um, how that affects clinical practice? Well, of course, we've seen in clinical practice uh, from, from Andreas cases that there is, um, the stent can be used in many different conditions, as you beautifully summarized. I think from a healing perspective, um, the biocompatibility of this device seems to be excellent, um, non-inferior statistically. However, I am puzzled or actually intrigued, not puzzled, intrigued by the fact that dimensions are a bit larger and let, if you look at the OCT parameters of neontimal proliferation, they're slightly less, again, non-significant, but numerically lower. So if we were to use an index that combined these two as a exploratory analysis, we may be able to find some sort of difference. We used to see in the past that the more you gain acutely, the more you lose, right? Mm -hmm. In this particular case, we gain more, slightly more, with uh, Firehawk, but we don't lose more. We lose exactly the same. And that result is obtained with a drug density that is actually lower than it is with science. It's an hypothesis, mm -hmm. but I think it is an interesting observation. I think it's a very good point, and, and the point that, uh, that, that William alludes to is the classic understanding that as you stretch the artery that you, you induce more, more injury and a more aggressive healing response. So as you increase the acute gain, you also increase the late loss. But in this case, that did not appear to be the case, at least at three months, that the neoenthymal hyperplasia was numerically even slightly less. I think it also points out, at least a trial like this, is that to discern differences among the very good drug-eluting stents is extremely difficult these days. <laughs> we have such good devices that it's very hard to be able to demonstrate objectively um, differences that you can immediately translate into clinical benefit. But the fact that this becomes a bare metal stent and has a small fraction of the drug density yet achieves superb results you could imagine under real world circumstances when we look at thousands of patients may translate into some benefit that is difficult to define in some of these mechanistic sub-studies. Sure, thank you. Well, thank you very much, William. So it's my pleasure to now invite Xubo. And of course, uh, Xubo has had a tremendous uh, experience uh, in the clinical program in, in China with this device. So they can give us, uh, he will give us an update on the five year target one randomized clinical trial results and the five year target two follow up results. Please, Xubo. Uh, thank you, Willem. It's my disclosure. As uh, Dr. Liang mentioned, this uh, uh, targeted clinical program in China, including the first immense study in single center in Fuan Hospital, and the target one randomized trial for workhorse stand, 460 patients, one-to-one -one randomized to Firehawk versus Zines. The primary endpoint of this randomized study is nine months uh, instant lay loss. I also have a long uh, Firehawk registry in 50 patients. Finally, uh, a, a registry, target to registry with uh, 730 patients. So totally in China, we 
uh, investigate uh, more than 1,000 patients treated with uh, Firehawk. This is the patient flow uh, from the randomized trial, 460 patients, one to one, nine months, uh, and the agrophic follow-up rate, uh, 87%, one year, 100% clinical follow-up. And finally, at five years, the clinical follow-up rate, 96.5%. Uh, at one year, the incidence of target lesion failure is 2.2 percent in each group. And if you look at the landmark analysis between one and five year, the uh, TRF was signs 4.4 percent and uh, Firehawk 3.6 percent. And uh, overall, the TRF through five years is uh, 6.6 uh, percent for. Uh, Zines 5.7 percent for Firehawk for this kind of uh, simple uh, single de novo lesions. If you look at the component of target lesion failure, cardiac death 1.4 percent was 0.4 percent, and ta uh, target vessel myocardial infarction 1.8 was 3.1, and ischemia driven TRR 3.2 was 4.4 uh, in Firehawk versus Zines. A group uh, respectively. Importantly, uh, we didn't see any definite problems and thrombosis with Firehawk through five years in this randomized trial. The second, for the long stem, uh, 50, 50 patients, you can see uh, from one year to five years, the TRF gradually increased from 4% to 12.8%. And in, uh, mainly driven by uh, ischemia-driven TRR, actually only three uh, TRR uh, occurred uh, within five years among these uh, 50 patients. Uh, for target two registry, it's a relatively complex lesion. We just uh, excluded the left main, a very severe three vessel disease and STEMI. So almost a, a real world patient, so 730, Patient enrolled in this uh, target two, one year follow up 99.5 percent. At five year, the follow up rate 96.93.6 percent. And this slide shows you the uh, cumulative uh, event rate and uh, uh, complementary mayor estimate of TRF and POCE uh, to five year, uh, 8.1 percent for TRF, 15.4 percent. For POC, patient oriented composite endpoint. Uh, carefully look at the uh, component of cardiac deaths uh, from 0.6% at one year to 2% to five year. TVMI 3.2% in one year and 4.4% to five year. TRR also very low from 1.1% in one year and uh, to 3.4% up to five year. And most importantly, we really see uh, so, uh, see a, a very few stem thrombosis, definitely probable stem thrombosis. And within one year, only one uh, stem thrombosis. Up to five years, we can see totally uh, five patients. So the even rate 0.7% in this uh, uh, relatively uh, more complex patient population. So finally, we did a patient level pool analysis. Uh, we put all the patients uh, treated by uh, Firehawk stand uh, from this uh, randomized workhorse trial, from, from this uh, long stand registry, also the target two registry. So you can see from this uh, patient flow from this slide, uh, 227, uh, 50, and 730, so totally um, 1,007. A Firehawk treated patient. At one year, the follow up rate 1990.6% uh, uh, until five years, the follow up rate 94.0%. Just to give you a brief uh, understanding about the baseline characteristic and the procedure result of the, all of these uh, 1,000 patients, uh, you can see the patient relatively young, 58.7 uh, years old, and uh, more than 70% male, diabetes 23%, 20, 
the number of target lesion per patient treated 1.3, a baseline QC showed reference vessel diameter 2.81 millimeter, uh, lesion length 23 millimeter. So the pa uh, standard per patient 1.58, and the overall device success rate extremely high 99.9 percent, .9 and the lesion success 99.6 percent. The DAPT utility uh, is uh, very interesting. You can see at one year, uh, around 90% uh, of a patient keep the DAPT. And, uh, and then uh, the, the, the use of DAPT re reduced significantly from two years, three years, five years, until five years. Uh, only 14.7% of the patient uh, continue to, do, to use DAPT. Uh, the uh, couple mayor estimate of the TRF at five years, uh, 7.6%, uh, POCE, 14.4%. And uh, this is a, a component of TRF. I think, again, most important thing is uh, definitely the problem of some thrombosis. I would say uh, it's very difficult to find uh, such kind of lower rate of stem thrombosis among all of the drug metallic drug looting stand trial. Also, we can understand this, uh, this is a relatively simple to monitor complex lesion, but however, only five patients uh, 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 definitely probable stem thrombosis until five years. And the very late stem thrombosis is also very low. Uh, if you look at the some uh, different subgroup, uh, you can see the diabetics, uh, five-year TRF, 9.2%, and small vessel, 6.7%, uh, a long lesion, 10.5%, multi vessel disease, 9.2%. Uh, we also did multivariable analysis. You can see among all of these uh, uh, factors, only long lesion is an independent predictor for five-year TRF with a hazard ratio 1.73. So in conclusion, the final five-year clinical follow-up results from the target one and two studies demonstrated that long-term uh, substantial safety and uh, efficacy profile of the abluminal groove field biodegradable polymer target release firehawk drug loading stand in the treatment of simple and intermediate complex coronary lesions patients, in particular, very low stem thrombosis rate through a five year. But however, I do think uh, in the future, uh, especially next year, uh, target all comer trial will inform more uh, important uh, data, uh, evidence to show uh, the Firehawk stand uh, the performance of the Firehawk stand in most complex population. Thank you very much for your attention. Impressive. Thank you very much. Questions to Kshubo about this um, impressive um, five-year data on a large, large group of patients. So Kshubo, I, I first wanted to congratulate you. This is, uh, this is really a program now with five-year follow-up. So this really speaks to the rigor in which the clinical trials are now being done in China. This is an old China program. And I'm not sure that the audience completely appreciates the, the initial trials were regulatory trials. Yeah. And now the standard for regulatory approval for a drug eluting stent was a 400 patient randomized trial with angiographic follow-up and an additional group to bring the total number to be over 1,000 patients with the experimental device. So this is a very rigorous standard that has been imposed by the Chinese, the, uh, Chinese regulatory authorities. So I really want to congratulate you for designing this potpourri of trials to fulfill that regulatory mandate. And we should also point out that to see an increment in TLF rates of about 1% per year is much less than what we're used to seeing with good drug eluting stents. And to see an overall ischemia-driven TLR rate at five years of 3.5% and a stent thrombosis rate to be much less than 1% at five years, these are really excellent results. Yeah. So I, 
again, want to congratulate our colleagues in, in, in China for doing some very high quality clinical research and for demonstrating that this new entry into the DES field um, certainly has passed most of the metrics and, and guidelines that we think are important to qualify it as an uh, important workhorse addition to the DES landscape. Yeah, uh, just like um, Mori mentioned, that actually the Firehawk, the target clinical program in China, is the first clinical program after the announcement of uh, CFDA China FDA guideline. So this is also the first study in uh, our field in China to finish to complete the five year follow up. I'm, I'm also very excited about. Now, thank you. Coming back to the, to the question that was uh, discussed earlier, of course, um, we have been by and large unable so far to show any significant difference long term even between biorodable versus durable polymers. So is this data going to resurrect this discussion? We all know about the editorial, what was it called? Um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary data. Was that the title? So do you think, um, I mean we have similar strut thickness. We have a similar drug, even lower dose. I mean, the, what what is the difference potentially? Uh, um, the polymer, may, yeah, or not. Yeah, but you know the design. May I may I emphasize something about the performance of the unique design? How to use this device uh, in this uh, real world uh, practice? Because this is a unique aluminum group field design. We can treat most complex patients. Actually, in China, we use. Firehawk to treat most complex patients, for example, severely calcified lesion, uh, without uh, concerning about the uh, crack or the uh, de destroy of the polymer. I, I mean, this is one of the potential. Also for uh, this morning life case, you can see we always use Firehawk to do life main bifurcation, easy to treat uh, with a two stand st strategy, something like that. And also the, um, I mean, the super results, better than better, identify the niche or the indications where still there is perhaps something to, to be improved. The long lesions, the diabetes, I mean, we knew that, but it's still the case, even though the gradient is not massive. And you, have, you would have to perform very long-term studies to show any difference, right? You yeah. need to go to five years. Yeah. Shubo, would you, would you allow me to ask a question to Dr. Leon sure. about the... Uh, IDE study. IDE I mean, stuff. without revealing any any secrets, how did the US FDA look at these data? Well, this is very interesting, and and again, I won't reveal any secrets. William asked me why I was interested in working with a new DES. I've been doing this for so many years. What what is the thrill? Well, I think that there are several components. One is I I have an emotional connection to the development of clinical research in China. And I feel a certain sense of pride in working with Jubo and being able to design what are important, rigorous clinical trials that would be respected globally. Um, a second was I have a reverence for new technology. And I was intrigued with the concept of having an abluminal um, coated device that would reduce the polymer load, that would reduce the drug density, um, and that may have some advantages ultimately over the conformal durable polymer uh, devices. So I think from a technology standpoint, I think this is a, um, a very, very interesting device. And third, I would like to see new DES in the United States. We've been living with three DES now since the very beginning, and I think that there is time to see new entry of creative new products. Now what the FDA has allowed us to do is to leverage some of the work being done in Europe. So the, so the target all-comer trial will be included as part of the IDE portfolio to allow us to do a slightly smaller randomized trial in the United States. So the current plan is to incorporate some of the data from the European all-comer study with a randomized trial in a slightly more restricted group of patients to be able to accelerate the approval process in the US. And that's what our goal is. It's not been fully approved yet by the FDA, but at least intellectually they've accepted the concept 
which means they believe that the data generated certainly in Europe and the predicate data from the early program in China is relevant for the US regulatory process, which is something new and important for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chubo. We're actually slightly ahead of schedule, so if, you know, this is your moment, right? You have the opportunity to ask any question that we have not addressed yet. Huh. You're too good. <laughs> Andreas, comment? No. Okay. Well, I think what we've seen so far is, is a program that is unique uh, in, in, many, uh, in many ways. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited about, about the technology in the cath lab. I'm, I'm excited about having uh, the option of using these uh, stents. I'm also excited about the, the trials program, which goes new ways uh, of regulatory uh, approval. So uh, all in all, uh, a very innovative, uh, innovative platform. And um, I will be watching this uh, product and this uh, development in the next years. Thank you. So, um, I can conclude. Thank you very much. So, in, in a nutshell, Dr. Leon has explained to us many things, actually, in f very little time. He has reviewed the clinical program. We've seen that uh, how extensive it is. Um, and we've learned, importantly, that uh, in addition to the uh, European target all commas, uh, we, we can anticipate to pretty soon have a, a US IDE trial, meaning that this technology that was uh, developed, nurtured, evaluated in, in China is going to become global, hopefully, within um, you know, the next, uh, next few years. We've seen from Andreas, uh, Dr. Baumbach, who is uh, the PI of Target uh, All Commerce Trial um, cases. And, uh, you know, he was um, actually, he did a gradation, you know, started very easy and uh, finished with more complex. And um, this is always important for interventionalists to see how, how the device actually works acutely. And we became, you know, painfully aware of how important the acute performance is with some of the newer technologies such as uh, scaffolds. So we've learned that um, this device really functions, it does what it is um, expected to do, even in very complex cases. And uh, Kshubo, you mentioned about the live case this morning, left main, very um, diffuse disease, LAD, circumflex, I don't know, those of you who've seen it, certainly this confirms what Andreas is telling us from from his experience, and it can be confirmed from the many cases uh, done in China. I had the privilege to show the uh, early three months OCT data, very carefully done and analyzed by a subset of six sites participating in the target all comma study. Um, the non-inferiority hypothesis was met, so there is actually no difference statistically in the uh, neo-intima formation after implantation of the best in class, considered best in class Science V device today versus the Firehawk device. And then um, the um, most impressive data that many of us, I think, uh, have ever seen long term, five years, with the device, where, with any device, were where shown by, by Kshubo with uh, extremely low event rates, no matter how you look at. Look at it, uh, patient-oriented, device-oriented, stent thrombosis very low, um, uh, with um, the anticipated gradient between uh, high-risk cases, diabetes, long lesions, but still absolute rates of events up to five years that are, that are very low. And of course, uh, uh, we, we have to raise the hypothesis that this is somehow related to uh, a lower polymer load and the um, unique uh, abluminal delivery of, of a lower dose of serolimus agent. So thank you very much for uh, attending the session and being uh, 
um, very supportive and uh, interested in uh, listening to us and asking questions. Thank you very much and I wish you a good rest of the day.